We're uh, now in the seventh week of our study of the Word. I hope you've enjoyed this series, and uh, we've seen how the, the Old Test Testament Scripture was developed. We learned about uh, books that were written between the Testaments. Uh, some were brought into our canon, some were not. Uh, we learned about the writings that after Jesus' death and why they. Uh, why certain books, uh, last week I talked about how certain books are in our Bible. <coughs> and today we begin to look at how certain people contributed to bringing us the book that we know today as the Bible. And uh, starting off this part, is our lesson today is going to be Eric Neubauer. Eric is a <laughs> former ordained uh, Protestant pastor who came into the Catholic Church in 2009. Eric holds his MA in theology with a focus in church history. Hmm. His academic interests are medieval church and the rise of the mendicant. How do you say that? Mendicant. Mendicant orders. It's a it's a religious order who depend directly on charity of others for their livelihood. Uh, also, the Reformation and Catholic social teaching. He served ten years as a pastor five years as a missionary, and now coordinates the faith formation program at St. Elizabeth and Seton here in Plano. He and his wife, Heather, have been married for 15 years and have three children. Aslan, Aislin. Aislin, uh, Mary Claire, and Joseph, a new baby boy. That's right. So please give a warm welcome to Eric Neubauer. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, uh, I will have to say, uh, forgive me if um, I'm a little bit fuzzy today. Uh, we, my wife has a knack, let me just say, of getting our kids to sleep through the night fairly early. Um, our first one slept through the night at six weeks. Our second one slept through the night. And Joseph, when he was born on the 20th of March, was nine pounds, 14 ounces, my wife is 4'11". <laughs> and uh, this guy is an eater. He's not sleeping through the night yet. <laughs> and, uh, and so I've, I've been trying my, my hardest to, um, to assist Heather during the evening hour, so I am, I am a little fuzzy uh, as well, but I'm really excited about being here. I appreciate the invitation. As a matter of fact, my wife was trying to ascertain how Roy uh, found out about me. I have no earthly idea, but I'm super excited to be here. As a matter of fact, as I was preparing and I was looking at uh, Roy's kind of notes, he's extremely organized, and uh, I kind of looked what he was uh, wanting me to talk about. Um, I was really excited. Uh, number one, because I got to brush up on Jerome and Latin Vulgate, which is exciting. Uh, number two, I get to talk about a period of time and an a influence the Vulgate had on a period of time that I'm extremely excited about, and that is the high Middle Ages of the Church. Um, I came into the Catholic Church uh, partially because of the Franciscans uh, and a, a love that I discovered I had for St. Francis of Assisi uh, and Mother Teresa and the Missionaries of Charity. Uh, so, um, hence the reason, uh, as a matter of fact, when I went to, uh, when I did my master's, I was thinking I was going to focus on moral theology. And uh, one of my teachers was the top moral theologian in the United States. And after a semester, I realized I am not a moral theologian. Uh, and so I decided to, to lean back on something that I've always loved, and that is history. Um, and 21 years old, when I gave my life to Christ, uh, he completely transformed me. Um, and uh, I decided at that point that I wanted to spend the rest of my life serving him. Um, and, uh, and so I thought this would uh, be appropriate for me to focus on church history, to focus on the mendicant orders, which were reform orders at the time, in particular with the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Um, and of course, I, I like the Reformation, obviously, as a form of Protestant, the Counter-Reformation. Um, and so this is um, a very uh, exciting for me to be here and to talk about a period of time that I have particular interest in. 
Uh, now, let me just say, as a former pastor, um, I like to talk. Um, and, uh, and so, when I realized that these weren't two hour and a half sessions, I had to pare down my, my uh, talk a little bit. Uh, but in, in light of that, one of the things I'm going to do that I don't normally do because of time is I'm going to be a little less extemporaneous on the intro, where we're actually going to look at the life of Jerome and how he developed as a person in the context of history, and then how he was a part of developing the Latin Vulgate. The second part uh, that I hope to talk about today, which will be a little bit more extemporaneous, and I'm very open to questions and thoughts and interruptions and whatnot, and that is when we get into how the Vulgate um, uh, had its influence um, on, uh, uh, on the Middle Age. Um, so it, it, technically, Roy had me at between 1100 and 1300, but we see the high Middle Ages here between 1000 and 1400, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, and before I begin, I want to set a little bit of historic context, because one of the things I realized about understanding God's Word, even as we read it today, is there's a proper and an, uh, an appropriate and an inappropriate way to understand Scripture, read Scripture, interpret Scripture. It's called a hermeneutic. And so uh, we have to understand how we approach the Scripture. Same thing with history. We have to understand the, the times in which we're dealing with. So, for example, I think it is important to note that, that prior to the Edict of Milan, what we were dealing with prior to 313 was what? The persecution of the church. Okay? Post 313 with the Edict of Milan and the fact that we now have the church uh, being legally recognized by the state and allowed to flourish in a peaceable atmosphere, we have a completely changing dynamic here that we never had before. As a matter of fact, the Pope that asked Jerome uh, to create a Latin version uh, of the scriptures at the time, Pope Damasus said this, uh, talking about the times in which we live, talking about a, 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 a decadent empire um, talking about lots of pagan influence, uh, very polytheistic, the emperor cult. Pope Damasus sees an opportunity. Uh, I think everybody saw the opportunity. And he said, um, he said, he set himself to interpret Rome's past, okay, this period of time here, decadence, uh, worship of idols and whatnot, not in the light of paganism, but of Christianity. He would Latinize the church and Christianize Latin. So we're talking about a, an approach that was going to completely transform uh, the empire uh, and what happened in the context of that empire and in the context of the church. Uh, so we see a, a, a change here. Um, so I, I wanted just to kind of set that. Are there any questions about that, about kind of the historical context that we're in? Okay, so what I'm going to do in this first part is I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of St. Jerome, okay, and who he was and how he came uh, to be the man of influence that he is today, okay? St. Jerome obviously didn't start off as St. Jerome. He started off as Eusebius Sophornius, was known as one of the most learned father of the Western Church. He was born between 340 and 342, although some people have him being born as late as 347 in a kind of uh, a not very well-known town called Stradonius on the Adriatic Sea in Dalmatia. As a matter of fact, I've been there. Uh, is a beautiful part of the world, near the Episcopal city of Aquila. Jerome was probably one of three children. It looks like he probably had a brother and sister as we analyze his writings. Uh, his father was a Catholic and a man of financial uh, means, uh, which meant uh, a couple of things. He was able to give his son a good education. This was key. Uh, because many, many people who had good educations were able to get what kind of jobs? Good 
empire jobs. We call them government bureaucrats now. <laughs> um, so he started off with a good elementary education in his hometown, uh, which would have uh, consisted of grammar and re uh, rhetoric. Um, one of the interesting things about his family is that Jerome was not baptized as a child. Um, interestingly about this idea that some believe uh, that way back when they wouldn't baptize Catholic children because of the commitment that came with a baptismal promise. And upon reflection in particular as we come through this Easter season and now at Pentecost, I think that's pretty interesting that, that people kind of took seriously that there ought to be a change in our lives as we go through baptism in confirmation on to our Christian life. So he, he was not baptized as a child. Um, as a young man, he was sent to Rome with his friends, uh, three friends, uh, Bonasus, Rufinius, and Helidorus. Man, I'm sure glad we got some different kind of names these days, I mean, I'm telling you. To receive instruction from the best Latin teachers. He was taught by a, a very famous pagan grammarian called Donatus and Victorinus, who was a Christian uh, rhetorician. It was during this time that he became fluent in Latin and Greek, became familiar with the great Latin authors, and began the development of his own personal library. Okay? His aptitude for oratory was such that he considered law, as I said, or government work. He was basically being prepared. It was kind of like St. Francis of Assisi, uh, coming from a, a, a family of means, kind of prepping him to take over his father's business. This was the same thing with St. Jerome um, uh, with, uh, as he was in Rome and, and, and preparing uh, for his life. Um, he, he acquired many worldly ideas, yet in spite of the pagan and hedonistic influences around him, uh, Jerome continued to visit, while in Rome, all the shrines of the apostles and the martyrs um, with his friends. And it was while in Rome that he and his friends had another internal conversion. And what happened with this internal conversion is that he decided that he wanted to become a friend of God and follow after God and serve God. So St. Jerome, as a young man, was baptized by Pope Liberius in 360. So we already kind of see the beginnings of this transformation, a very smart individual, like yourselves, okay? <laughs> Getting a great education, okay? In the context of that education and being in this amazing city surrounded by the contrast between the empire and the church, had his own kind of spiritual conversion. Again, it reminds me a lot of St. Francis. After three years in Rome, Jerome's intellectual curiosity led him to explore other parts of the world. He visited his home, and then accompanied by his friends, he went to Aquiella, where he made friends among the monks of the monastery there, notably Rufinius. Then he accompanied uh, with his friends, or uh, still accompanied by his friends, he traveled to a place called Treves, uh, which the important, uh, asked, uh, important thing about uh, this particular city is that it was both an imperial residence at the time and it was the administrative headquarters. So people who were of education, of means, looking for good work, this is the kind of place that they would settle into. Um, while there, he experienced, again, I kind of uh, preface this, another conversion around 370. Um, where he renounced his secular pursuits. Now, the, the interesting thing that, as we see the development of, uh, of Jerome, um, I think the fascinating thing is, is context. Um, and here we see that Jerome is influenced by the monastics. He's influenced by this kind of ascetical life, um, uh, commitment to obedience and, and following Christ and contemplation and reflection. And, uh, and you can see, at least I can see, almost why it was attractive. Um, and I think why uh, uh, aspects of monasticism are quite attractive today uh, with the busyness of life and uh, so many things kind of vying for our attention and competing for our attention. Um, here we've got Rome, uh, Jerome kind of settled in between these two worlds and he, and he begins to gravitate towards a kind of monastic 
lifestyle, wanting to get away from all of that, shed all of those things that he felt like were pulling at his, uh, pulling at his attention and, and his time, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, give himself completely over to God. Finally, they arrived in Antioch at 373, where Jerome attended lectures uh, by uh, Apollonius, a bishop of Laodicea, there he learned of Origen's writings, improved his Greek, studied philosophy, theology, with a particular emphasis on the Trinity. It was important, uh, this emphasis on the Trinity, because there was a lot of discussion about the reality of who the Trinity actually was, of the doctrine of the Trinity. So with his companions, he left for the desert, about 50 miles southeast of Antioch. Um, Innocent and Hylas soon died there. Uh, Helordius uh, left and returned west. Basically, all of his friends left. Okay, but Jerome stayed for four years, where he passed the time in study and the practice of asceticism. Okay, in reality, though, okay, and this is why I wanted to give you guys this bit here. This is an extremely good book. It's only 100 pages. Um, in reality, his desert years uh, were more like spending time in a borrowed country home. Uh, hagiography likes to assert that Jerome spent time in a secluded cave, but in truth, Jerome's isolation was accompanied by study, by correspondence, by copying manuscripts, uh, language lessons by a Jewish scholar, Hebrew lessons, uh, debated the Trinity, although Jerome was known for his submission to the Bishop of Rome on the subject. So Jerome came in line. It was interesting at this time uh, the church uh, began to put forth uh, an orthodox, uh, kind of its stamp on an orthodox view of the Trinity, and people began kind of lining up in, in one of two camps. Those that were for a traditional orthodox view of the Trinity, the, the Trinity we understand today, and those that had variant or divergent views on the Trinity. Uh, Jerome was known for his orthodox view of the Trinity. It was during this time of seclusion that Jerome threw himself uh, in spirit at the feet of Christ, he says in his own words, watering them with my tears and tamed my flesh by fasting whole weeks. I am not ashamed to disclose my temptations, though I grieve that I am not now what I was then. When he left the desert, he, re he was received uh, from Paulinius's hands, his ordination as priest. Jerome consented to ordination only on the condition that he should not be apply, obliged to serve a particular church, knowing his true vocation was to be a monk and a recluse. It was during this time that Jerome encouraged what we call radical ascetic living among uh, noble women. At the time, it was kind of interesting. Um, and uh, this was something that they took on in their homes, a life of prayer, a life of seclusion. Um, and he cultivated wealthy ascetics as patrons so that he could continue the development of his academic career and cultivate his desire to be a monk. See, the reality of the intellectuals of the day, we have to understand, okay, is that they needed to have patrons, okay? Anybody that has kids in college that have gone beyond the normal four years understands that you've been kind of a patron to your child, in particular if they go on to do their master's or if they go on to do their doctorate. Um, and it was like this back in Jerome's day as well that, that he actually had to become kind of like a, in a sense, a spiritual leader of people who were in his kind of a vein or stream of spirituality. And it was in those contexts uh, and because he was of a high intellectual nature and he kind of ran in those circles that he was able to cultivate folks who wanted to see his uh, work go forward. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about this is regardless of what we believe about that history, okay, without that history, okay, we wouldn't have the Latin Vulgate. Uh, and, and I think this is what's significant and what is important uh, because of what the Latin Vulgate ultimately meant, which we'll talk about that in just a little bit. <coughs> then in 380, Jerome goes to Constantinople to study the scriptures under Greek, uh, uh, Gregory of uh, Nizanzius, uh, then the bishop of that city. Two years later, he went back to Rome with Polinius of Antioch to attend the council 
which Pope Damasus was holding to deal with the Antioch Schism. Okay? Appointed secretary of the council, Jerome acquitted himself so well that when it was over, Damasus kept him there as his own secretary. And here we see the, the, the positioning of Jerome with Pope Damasus to begin his work on the Latin Vulgate. Interestingly, okay, uh, during this time, it took longer to become a theologian, okay, than to become a doctor or a lawyer, okay? Uh, and I, I think that's kind of interesting. It took 14 years. You weren't allowed to have your, your doctoral letters until you were at least 35 years of age. So this idea of the importance of theology, uh, how rigorous it was, um, how much you needed to know. I mean, can you imagine Jerome not only had to know his own local tongue, but then Greek, he had to learn Hebrew, then Latin, he had to be able to translate and write. Um, and so it, it's kind of a, an amazing uh, thing to think about who this person was. At the Pope's request, he prepared a revised text based on the Greek of the Latin New Testament, the current version which had been disfigured by wrong copying, clumsy correction, careless interpolations, and he revised the Latin Psalter. And I'm sure this is kind of what you may have been hearing in your uh, classes in the lead up here, is that as we look at some of these older versions of the Bible, we see that there was lots of little human errors uh, that as, uh, as um, uh, uh, people develop their intellectual capacities and their ability to understand um, how to put these texts together, how they were continuously revised. So in three before Pope Damasus dies and was succeeded, um, uh, and the next pope was uh, less friendly to Jerome, but while serving Damasus, Jerome had impressed all by his personal holiness, learning, and integrity. He also had managed to get himself widely disliked by the pagans and evildoers whom he had condemned, and also people of taste and tolerance, many of them who were offended by his sarcasm and his ruthless attacks. So Jerome was kind of known as a prolific writer. Um, he not only uh, was an apologist against the pagans, but he was calling uh, the wealthier Christian community to account for their kind of, uh, in a sense, loose living. Um, and he was very bold and probably a little too brash, you know. Uh, we like our uh, pastors and church leaders sometimes to be a little bit more sensitive when they're calling us to account. Uh, nevertheless, this is what we see in Jerome, uh, not only the translation of the scriptures and the commentaries of the scriptures, but all of the other writings back and forth that influenced the day. Um, let me see here what I want to go to next. Yeah. An apologist against the pagans means that he preached. He was defending the faith against the pagan influence of the time. Yeah. And against the virgin Christian influence at the time, uh, and against uh, people who didn't subscribe to his kind of spirituality. Um, whether that was calling people to a moral account, or whether that was just a, a disagreement, you know, uh, my church is better than your church kind of a thing. Uh, and so here we see. Uh, Jerome uh, writing vociferously, um, dealing with all of these different issues. And again, it's kind of, again, uh, looking back into Roman history, here we have uh, a, a day in which when I, I look at Roman history, I see a lot of our current history today. It's very, very similar. Um, let me just say this, but when the Christian faith was threatened, Jerome could not be silent. While at Rome, in the time of Damasus, he composed a book on the perpetual virginity of Mary. Um, in 393, he wrote two other books against Jovinian, which was a, uh, a heretic. And the first, he described the excellence of virginity. Uh, these other books were written in his vehement style, um, and there were expressions in them which seemed lacking in respect um, uh, for those that he was speaking to. A few years later, he turned his attention uh, to uh, Vigilantis, uh, a Gallic priest who was denouncing both celibacy and the veneration of saints' relics, calling those who revealed them idolaters and worshipers of ashes. In defending celibacy, 
He, uh, Jerome said that a monk should purchase security by flying from the temptations and dangers when he distrusted his own strength. As to the veneration of relics, he declared, we do not worship the relics of the martyrs, but honor them in our worship of him whose martyrs they are. We honor the servants in order that he respect, uh, that the respect paid to them may be reflected back to the Lord. Honoring them, he said, was not idolatry because no Christian had ever adored the martyrs as gods. On the other hand, they pray for us. So this is his position. If the apostles and the martyrs, while still living on earth, could pray for other men, how much more may they do it now after their victories? Positioning there. Now getting to the good part here. In 395 to 400, Jerome was engaged in a war against Origenism, unhappily created a breach in his long friendship with Rufinius. This was a big deal. Uh, finding that some of the Eastern monks had been led into error by the authority of Rufinius' name and learning Jerome attacked him. Rufinius then, living in a monastery at Jerusalem, had translated many of Origen's works into Latin and was an enthusiastic upholder of his scholarship. Though it does not appear that he meant to defend the heresies of Origen's writings, August, Bishop of Hippo, Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, was one of the churchmen greatly distressed by the quarrel between Jerome and Rufinius and became unwillingly involved in the controversy. Jerome's passionate controversies were the least important part of his activities. What has made his name so famous was his critical labor on the text of the scriptures. The church regards him as the greatest of all doctors in clarifying the divine word. He had the best available aids for such an undertaking, living where the remains of biblical places names and customs all combined to give him a more vivid view than he, could have, than he could have had at a greater distance. To continue his study of Hebrew, he hired a famous Jewish scholar, Bar Ananias, who came to teach him by night, lest the other Jews living in uh, Jerusalem and Bethlehem should learn of it. As a man of prayer and purity of heart, whose life had been mainly spent in study, penance, and contemplation, Jerome was prepared to be a sensitive interpreter of spiritual things. Okay? We have seen that already while at Rome, he made a revision of the current Latin New Testament and of the Psalms. Now he undertook... Yes? So Jerome gets credit for getting it right in terms of the translation, right? Having a much better translation than what was had at the time. As a matter of fact, what predated uh, Jerome's translation of the Latin Vulgate is the Codex Synapticus here. This is a full folio version of that, um, which was the oldest, um, about as complete as they had at the time. The Codex had the uh, Septuagint, Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. And so what Jerome did by learning all of these languages and being a study of philosophy and theology and having lived, again, in all of these places, okay, settling in the Holy Land, okay, is here we have him trying to write the best version possible with the intellectual tools that he had at the time, okay? And so this is what we see in the development of the Latin Vulgate, not only in the development of the Vulgate, but in all of his work done um, in um, commentaries on many, many of the books of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So this is really where we're at with Jerome. We, we kind of see this, this, this man who's had an experience, uh, high intellectual uh, capacity, who then, uh, gets asked uh, to develop a Latin version. Why? Because we're Latin, we're Christianizing uh, Latin, right? We're changing the whole culture of what we had at the time. Here we have the church persecuted. Here we have the church now legal and growing and developing and all sorts of opportunity for it to uh, develop uh, the Latin Vulgate. And obviously from that point, uh, we have uh, our other texts um, that have been developed since then. So yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating, it's interesting. I think one of the interesting things uh, about the Latin Vulgate, and I'll kind of skip to this, 
because uh, I think it's fascinating, may engender some more questions, is we see uh, its, um, uh, its influence uh, in the church. Um, and it's one of the things that Roy asked me to, to talk about. So I, I was looking from the completion of Jerome's Vulgate in 405, okay, by Middle Ages, basically to 1522 plus. Now, <clears throat> these dates are, are never exact. Some believe Jerome was born in, on one day. Some believe Jerome was born 10 years later on another day. So uh, 1522 plus represents Luther's translation of the New Testament scriptures into German, okay? The rejection of the Apocrypha uh, uh, from the future Protestant texts. But what we have here, okay, which is interesting, is we have 1,000 years, okay, of influence, of education, of development, of dissemination, uh, one of the, the fascinating things about this time period that we have here was the development of both the cathedral school, the schools in the friaries, um, the schools, the university system, uh, which the church developed. Um, and so here we have the, the, the people trained under the Vulgate, under the commentaries, uh, that were produced in and around the Vulgate um, under the apologetic work of Jerome, okay, debating between orthodoxy and heresy, uh, which are debates that are still ongoing. Uh, Ross Dow, that's a, a, a Catholic uh, thinker, uh, New York Times columnist, just wrote a book called Bad Religion, you might want to pick up talks about the history of Orthodox Christianity in the United States and how it's changed. You know, and how there's some, uh, underneath the surface, some heretical movements that have rejected what all of us here, as a, as a confirmed Methodist, uh, all of us would, would hold as essentials and key to our faith. Um, so we have, what's interesting in Jerome is we have a fascinating um, a, amount of influence. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the Vulgate is what uh, the, the friars used. Um, it, as a matter of fact, at the, it, it, in the beginning, um, at Oxford University, um, most of the teachers, 300 of them, were Franciscans. As a matter of fact, the chair of the religious education department, uh, a person who I follow and speak with quite frequently, of Oxford is still a Franciscan, uh, and uh, one of the most prolific authors on uh, Franciscans and uh, mendicant orders in St. Francis there is. And so um, we see uh, this, we also see because of this, um, and because of the, the high Middle Ages and the Renaissance uh, papacy, and some of the reforms that were beginning to develop at the time, it was an increased desire for what? Oh, okay. There's an increased desire for education. Okay? So we're educating more people than we ever have before. Yes, sir? Define the term Vulgate. Yeah. Define the term Vulgate. You know, I don't know if I have an exact definition of the Vulgate. Is it a matter of fact? Yes, yeah. I'm sorry? Some what, what can be? Well, the, the, basically what we're talking about in, in the Latin Vulgate is we're talking about the uh, development of the scripture, the Old Testament from the Hebrew, so Jerome doesn't go back to the Greek, which is what was common at the time, he goes back to the Hebrew and retranslates the Old Testament in, in a more proper fashion. As a matter of fact, the Catholics just went through this with their own missal. Um, they realized that we had a, a poor translation. We've been living with it for a long time. We've been influencing all of the Southern Hemisphere because they don't have Latin scholars. So they went back and did a more appropriate translation, which changed some of what is said in the Mass. Hence, we see this is what was going on here. They knew um, that they had problems. They knew that they had copyist errors. And so the, the Vulgate just is the... It's like the Codex Synacticus. I mean, the Vulgate was the Old Testament uh, translated from the Hebrew, not the Septuagint, uh, almost in, in completion 
and the entire Greek New Testament, which was complete at the time, uh, into Latin, which propagated it, uh, which put it out there uh, for more people to read, to study. I mean, is there a, an adjective definition of Vulgate? No, the, the Vulgate literally was like you saying, I've got my, uh, my New American Standard Bible with me. The Vulgate at the time was the translation from the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the translation of the Greek New Testament in toto in Latin with the best scholarship at the time trying to weed out. As a matter of fact, if you look, I've got the Codex Sinaiticus opened up to Matthew. Obviously, unless you read Greek, uh, you're probably not going to get it. Um, but I've got the Codex Sinaiticus over here, and uh, it's got um, uh, Augustine's and Jerome's notes scribbled in the margins. Um, and so, um, it, it's it's you know they were uh, just like any Christian of goodwill, uh, working hard at uh, um, at bringing the the Bible uh, to completion in a sense, uh, kind of gathering it from the four corners. Roy, I just happen to have a, a brief definition. Oh, good. you know you I, I see you like that. I was about to grab my phone. Jerome's <laughs> translation is known as the Vulgate from the Latin. Latin word vulgus, All right, meaning Latin. common language, and it became the standard translation for the next millennium. In 1546, the Council of Trent declared the Vulgate the only authentic Latin text of the scriptures. That's right, that's right. So we, we have this influence, okay, like we said, into the 16th century, okay? But because, because of this, the Reformation, uh, this is where we have a divergent path, okay? But you have to remember, the Vulgate is still, uh, for Catholics, uh, one of the key versions with which scholarship, um, it, you know, when we go back to look at what scholars use uh, in their uh, understanding, interpretation, looking back at as original as we can get. Um, as you've learned, probably, uh, the development of the scripture uh, was interesting. You know, it wasn't uh, like it is today where we kind of write a book from beginning to end. I mean, they literally had a to go out uh, to where these um, different letters were, uh, where different bits and bobs, as a matter of fact, just to get this together so it wouldn't be lost forever and to put this folio version together, they had to coordinate between three different countries in a monastery just to get all the pages. And you'll see if you page it, it's quite interesting. Those pages that were at the British Library were stamped with a, a little stamp from the British Library. You're like, oh my gosh, why did you do that on the papyrus, but this animal skin. Um, but the, the other interesting thing is it's 95%. So literally, when you look at that, that was uh, the, the scriptures uh, in, uh, in and around the, some of the earliest times that, that or in the uh, fourth century. That's what they would have looked like. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> when we study the Bible today, uh, especially the Old Testament. Sometimes we bump into uh, verses that we, we just don't understand and we, we begin to wonder and the conversation always comes up that, well, you know, the Bible has been through many different translations, many different corrections. And when we get back to Jerome right here, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, the original authors were in Hebrew and in Greek. And those original authors, they thought they knew what they were talking about. 400 years later, some guy comes along and says, no, that's wrong. And let me change this. How do we know, how do we have faith that the decisions that Jerome made were the ones that God intended and God screwed up the first time when he told the first guy? Yeah. 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 The, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're a man of faith. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm assuming we're in a, a community of faith. Um, and I was talking to Roy about this earlier, um, and, and we have to understand and be, and be honest with ourselves that we are part, even though Christ established the church, however you actually technically look at how he established that, really doesn't matter. He established his church, and it is a human institution. I mean, we are humans, infallible, uh, and have our own agendas. Uh, and in that light, I'm pretty sure 
that Christ uh, has that foreknowledge. And so I believe not only are we dealing with uh, men who generally speak of goodwill, but we also have to believe that Christ had his hand in the development of the scriptures that we have today. And I take solace in the fact that we've now had literally decades upon decades of what we call textual criticism. And that is where they go through the text using all the academic tools at their disposal to try to ascertain um, if we got it right. Uh, and now for two, generally speaking, now because we're going back to oral tradition, but I'll just say it this way for lack of a better phrase, for two millennia now, uh, it seems as if we're standing on pretty good ground. Uh, you might have a little bit more difficulty if you're, a, 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 in a sense, a kind of um, radical fundamentalist who wants to assign a literal interpretation of every word, phrase, and story in the Bible. Uh, so this is where we now go into, into methodology of how do we actually interpret the Scripture, and that's really quite important. Um, and one thing that I would encourage everybody to do a little bit of home study on is how is it that we, that we study the Scripture? How do we know? I mean, the Scripture not only was written by different people in different languages, right? Okay, But there's different literary forms. I mean, we've got the poem, poetry of the Psalms, and we've got this weird apocryphal writing of uh, the uh, uh, book of Revelation, the book of Daniel. Okay, And so we have to realize that in the first century, the world, the literary world, was filled with apocryphal writing so that when they read the letter to the seven churches, it wasn't odd, okay? When we read the letter to the seven churches, it's a little weird. Our world is not full of apocryphal writing anymore like it, like it was. Um, or apocalyptic, I'm sorry, apocryphal, uh, apocalyptic uh, literature. And so you have to understand how do we take apocalyptic literature, how do we take poetic literature, how do we read and interpret the different stories of scripture, um, how literal do we go, do we not go. Um, so these are all things that are, are, I think, a part of that. But I do, my faith, where I, what I lean on is I look at the history, I look at where we're at today, um, and I see that with all of the arrows and with all of the people who would love to see an end to the Bible, uh, that we've got it, uh, in about, I think, the place that the Lord would have us. And I think my faith says that if the Lord wanted us to have more, we'd have more. You know, I think the essentials of what we need to be followers of Christ uh, and to live the kingdom life here on earth is, is, is uh, in the context of the scriptures as we understand them today. And for all of the little things that might be might be problematic, you know, uh, where we still have uh, interpretive uh, or translation arguments. Um, those are fairly minor. The interesting thing, uh, now this was my, my former uh, Protestant pastor uh, who was real big into biblical archaeology. Uh, he would always note that biblical archaeology continues to what? Prove the veracity of what we have today, not disproven. So the more they did, the more they uncover, the more they get, the more they see that what we have today and what we had back then was quite good, you know. Um, and I, I think it only makes people nervous, and I was actually contemplating about this before I came here today. I think it only makes us nervous when we are trying to assign a kind of perfection which is the idea of, can we really trust it, okay? Uh, and I, I think we can. I think we can trust it. Um, and uh, so, yes? How long did he live, and what was the average lifespan? You said that 34 was yeah. when they were okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. isn't that interesting? Yeah, you were an old, 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 old guy. As a matter of fact, I have that here. Um, Get my pages out of order here. Let's 
that I did. Going along with that, it seems what you were saying about 35, it was 35 uh, people, or 35 before they got everything, so maybe they, they figured that once you're 35, you get interfered enough, and you're going to be marched off. That's what? immediately what I thought when you got there, 35. Why was that year hit? Wasn't that when they died all? The uh, lifespan was 20, part. so 70, so he was 50 <coughs> some odd. 50 was the lifespan? No, I'm, I'm saying he was around 50. He was born around 70, died around 20. Sure. Yeah, so he was around 50. So, yeah, um, but, uh, you know, the lifespan was shorter too, but also the, um, you know, we're kind of all in a rush. Um, back then, the approach. Uh, to learning was different. And we have to remember, too, uh, that uh, one of the reasons why the Bible wasn't disseminated uh, to probably folks, I'm not, I, won't, I won't put you in my category, but I would probably have been of the peasant caste, uh, was that during this time, okay, we're coming out of a feudal type system. One of the interior reforms that of the Catholic Church at the time were that prior to this time and during this time, the bishops kind of acted as feudal lords, okay? So you still had this peasant class, as a matter of fact, um, uh, preaching, okay, and listening to sermons was a form of entertainment. Hence the reason why the Franciscans had such a great following, because guess what the Franciscans did? And the development of the mendicant orders and why it hacked the priestly class off, because they would go into the piazzas, they would go into the plazas and they would preach, and literally hundreds of people would come out. Why? No internet, no 42 inch plasma TV, <laughs> no cable television, no DVD, no TiVo, no podcasts, none of that stuff. Okay? So life was slower. Okay? Uh, preaching was seen as a form of entertainment and, in a sense, a form of education. So, regardless of of, of uh, the Bible being in Latin or the Bible being in German, the, we're talking about the literacy rates, okay, here were still sky high, okay? I could have had the Bible in every language known to man, and we still would have had a huge uh, 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 percentage of the population, generally speaking, that during this time frame would not have known. Now, whether we agree or disagree with Catholicism, where we have to give it its props, is the fact that they were in the development of the educational system, okay? Now, today we're the beneficiaries of that because now our children uh, are schooled at a very young age and they kind of have this, this process uh, going through the ages. So this is, this is the kind of interesting when we, again, in this way, historical perspective is so important because a lot of times we like to kind of say, you know, well, uh, you know, the church either wanted or didn't want, you know, people to be able to read the Bible. The reality is, is this is why iconography was so popular, uh, because it was the, the literacy rates. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, in, this, in the historical society that we're speaking about, I mean, people are trying to figure out how to put food on the table, you know. And, and you had two other issues. One is they very often change the Bible to the altars because they they wanted to be the ones to disseminate the information mm -hmm. as as they felt the information should mm -hmm. be disseminated. And secondly, until the printing press mm -hmm. uh, all of that had to be hand copied and hand quite copied expensive. And Correct. Uh, it, it wasn't until after the printing press yeah. and, of course, that day escaped me right now. Yeah. The but interesting thing is that we have to hear, but I, I would even argue to that, to that point, um, and we can argue the, you know, how good or bad the educated class was during the time, that even after the printing press, even after a much more wider swath of the, the globe was able to get a hold of this stuff, it would be interesting to study the statistical reality of literacy rates. And, and sure, with the printing press and the invention, and as schools developed, we had more and more of that. So it was kind of an inevitability. Um, and I, I, I'm not uh, a, a proponent 
uh, probably am a little bit idealistic, but I'm not a proponent of, you know, everybody was bad and wanted to hold, you know, people kind of under their thumb. I mean, you know, yeah, it was a system, but it was a system that was already beginning to change here in the high Middle Ages, uh, and realizing the church was unable to operate uh, under that system, and this was the, the beginning with the Protestant Reformation and beyond was the beginning of the radical uh, internal change, even with the relationship between the church and state. Well, that do come from the Middle Ages and, and begin to change, but but likely very slowly. Yes. And that change took time. Yes. Took took a, a long time, and it 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 took time for the average person to to learn how to read, and Correct. even if they had Bibles in their home, to to learn how to yeah. read. Yeah. So I guess kind of what I'm trying to say too is that, and this even goes for post-Reformation, I don't want to put something on the church that was also a factor in society. Uh, the church right. is responsible, if we all we all understand that at some level, but we also have to have to give society its dues for where society and culture was at, moving from a feudal system to a different type of, of economy. Um, I mean, this is really why St. Francis was able to get ahead, because his father was a part of the burgeoning middle exactly. merchant class. Exactly. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns? I just, I, I find it interesting that, that the Catholic Church in Jerome uh, decided to write this in Latin because it was the predominant language, I guess, at the time. But it's kind of ironic that the church held on to Latin until it wasn't popular with the people anymore. And what they started out do, doing was making a Bible that was available to everyone. Yep. And then at the end, they held on to it so long that no one could read it anymore. Sure. Well, the church, if you, if you look at the timeline, uh, uh, produced a, an English translation uh, pretty quick here. Um, so it wasn't that far off before we had an English translation. Uh, but, but let me just say this as well, that uh, you know, there's two that can be said of the Catholic Church. Number one, it is absolutely slow. It's like the tight hand, man. That thing is going to turn extremely slowly. Interestingly, though, you can see where that benefits the church because sometimes we can be reactionary and where that hinders the church, okay? Um, and I, I think the church is really on an upswing, one of the reasons why I was hired um, was because of my background, uh, because of outside eyes looking in, because of my passion for the scriptures. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's, it is it's this kind of Leviathan that can be slow sometimes. Uh, and I've seen that both have uh, positive and negative effects. I think the other thing, let me just say this too, is that there are some things um, in relationship to holding on to a particular tradition that has, in a sense, its own kind of amazing beauty. It's kind of like, why do people still hold on to the original 1611 King James Version of the Bible? I mean, we know, technically speaking, that it is not the best translation any longer. It just isn't. I mean, that's just the reality of academics. It's the poetry. It's the beauty of the text. It's what they knew. Um, and I think this is why uh, Latin was, in a sense, the religious language for so long. Because, in a sense, there is this kind of beauty in the Latin. Now, I like mass in the vernacular. Uh, but I have been to a Latin mass, and it does have its own kind of beauty. And that, I think, is connected to another historical reality, and this is the cathedral, the development of the cathedral. You know, at the time, uh, uh, they, they said uh, both the development of the cathedral, the building, uh, the, the time of the church, and the development of the Vatican Library, they said, uh, they said you're crazy. You're going to run a stride. Uh, we don't have enough money. And, uh, and the Pope said, no, the reason why we're doing this is because when people walk into the house of God, okay, we want them to be struck with awe and wonder, a reality that here God is this huge, all-encompassing uh, being. And so, you know, we see this kind of, uh, you know, positioning um, as...
as uh, as you know why certain things were done or why we held on to a particular tradition. Uh, some of it is they wanted to uh, reveal how wondrous and beautiful and kind of awe-inspiring God was. So my time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you.